Let's wake up. Wake up, people. Jesus, Mary, who's here? Who's here this morning? We hear you. For God's sakes, come on. I know the Knicks lost the ping pong lottery, but we'll make up for it. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. All right, let's try to do this better than the last moderator, okay? That guy was a hack. <laughs> it's a joke. We he's, wrote books together. I love Mike. I love Mike. He's right next, right down Is he there. Still, can he still hear this? Yes, he can. He's about to rush the stage. Damn it. Sorry, Mike. I love you. <laughs> All right. Uh, creative destructions, rises and crashes, booms and busts. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with the work of Carlotta Perez, but even if you're not familiar with her work and her name, you probably have a general idea of what she's been talking about for decades, which is really kind of uh, development cycles and technology going all the way back to the industrial age and the long sort of uh, cycle of how that affects society and what happens within that and some of the pain that is inherent in that process. And there's something I wanted to read to get us started off. She wrote this just a week ago. Uh, I'm just going to read a couple, couple of first graphs of a blog post she wrote and we'll kind of launch on from there. So she says, innovation, as Schumpeter held, is the driver of growth in market economics, economies. Okay. But although technical change is constant, it is not strictly continuous. Once or twice in each century, the whole economic system is deeply transformed by a technological revolution that changes the patterns of production and consumption. And I think you guys can start to see something familiar here, right? The early decades are characterized by a ruthless process of unfettered free markets and creative destruction while the new paradigm is learned. Major financial bubbles and their collapse announce, as in the 1930s and now, the need for the social shaping, social, social shaping of the new potential. And I think that's where we are now. You look at this industry, Bitcoin, crypto, digital currencies, digital securities, all these different, there is a lot of potential there. Somehow that is going to connect with the wider society. The question is, where does that stand right now? How does that happen? And how does that progress? And as the CEO of a large company in this industry, and as a early investor in this industry, I would think you gentlemen have some insights on that. <laughs> Great open-ended question. Yeah. <laughs> so first Makes of all, I mean, me. Carlota Perez, I think, is, is spot on in that analysis. And actually, Fred Wilson is the one who introduced me to that concept uh, back in the day. So um, I do think we're going through that cycle. That's exactly what's happening in cryptocurrency. Um, one thing I would maybe disagree with her on is that it, it's not, I don't think it's any longer one or two a century. Hopefully, we're getting more like one a decade at this point, um, because I think technology just continues to accelerate in, in the world, and that's generally a good thing. So to your point, um, it starts off in this kind of free market, this primordial soup, and you see this Cambrian explosion of ideas. You know, look, look at all the people in the room, all the companies being funded in this space. Um, we've never seen more good teams um, out there building cool stuff and venture money flowing into this space. So it does feel like we're in that kind of, uh, to me, the free market phase of it where there's just tons of amazing ideas happening. Now, at some point, I, I think this is actually pretty far in the future, um, the space you know, may start to reach a size where it starts to have a really big um, you know, social impact, as you, as you said. Uh, like, let's say that more than 50% of all people are primarily doing their banking and financial services in cryptocurrency. That's, we're not there yet. That, that could be 10 years away or something like that. Um, but once we get there, I think you're right. Companies like Coinbase will uh, have a, a big responsibility and a lot of scrutiny in a world like that. Um, my, you know, I think one of the important things to realize, though, is that the beautiful thing about cryptocurrency is that it's kind of like the internet. It's decentralized. Nobody owns it. Um, nobody really controls it. So, you know, that's a really great check and balance on um, companies in the, spaces in the space because if Coinbase does something you don't like or our fees are too high or whatever the issue is, you, can, you have choice and your switching cost is very low. You can always take your cryptocurrency off and go to another provider. So in that sense, I think it'll always be a free market um, when, when switching costs are low and that's going to be great for everybody, um, consumers, businesses, um, all of society. You know, uh, last year on this stage, um, Balaji um, said something that I've thought a lot about over the past year, and he said, you know, anybody can make a crypto, anybody can make a currency in their dorm room, right? And, right. and I was, we were just waiting to come up here on stage, and 
we were hanging out with a guy who's literally made his own currency <laughs> so that people can buy a stake in his book that he's going to self-publish, right? And you just think about that. It's like and that. And he thanks you for that free promotion that you just gave him, right? Of course, now. but my point is, like, that is kind of flipping the publishing model yeah. on its head and, and saying every single person, oh, and the way it's going to work, by the way, is if you buy the book on Amazon, you take the email receipt and you send it to him and he'll send you the token and then you have a stake in the book, right? So the book and the coin is all the same thing. It's like, I don't know if it'll work, but it's such a provocative, different way of thinking about things and it's possible because anybody can make a currency in their dorm room. That's the fundamental thing. It just flips money on its head. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I, while we were talking about, what was that guy's name again? Give him a <laughs> Go ahead, do it. No, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna wait. We're going to keep this in stealth, and he's going to come out <laughs> <Yeah>. later. <laughs> September. Look for it. Uh, yeah, it's funny, because I, I was thinking the same thing. I mean, it, it is a really good example early, right? Like you said, you don't know if it'll work. But it is a really good example of, of one piece of the potential of this kind of technology. And if it works for him, that becomes something very positive for him. The, the flip side of that, of course, is what does that mean for the, the industries that are already existing and they make their business selling books and right. they've been going through a lot of convulsions. In my industry, media has been going through a lot of convulsions over the last few decades. As the internet, you talk about technologies coming every you know, 10 years or so. But the truth is, right, we still want to read stories, yes. right? We still want to watch films, we still want to listen to music, we still want to see beautiful art. So that will never change. But what does change is the ways that those things get financed, the way that those things come right. to market, the way that we might participate in those systems. And we got, I feel like, halfway there with the internet. The internet changed the way that that could get delivered to us. But what Mark Andreessen said was what they, when they wrote the spec for the internet, they forgot about money, right? And what cryptocurrencies do, I think, is give us money in internet form, decentralized like the way everything else works on the internet. So now we can, I think, go the rest of the way in truly rethinking the entire supply chain, right? Not just how it gets delivered, but also how um, the creator gets rewarded and how the the consumer pays for it and, and everything else. Yeah, you know, I, I want to turn this to you, Brian, and, and ask you a slightly pressing question. But, uh, it, it is interesting, right? We're talking about reinventing money and what it can do. That's all great and fine. And you've built a business over the last seven plus years now. Um, you've made a couple of moves lately that have been very interesting. We're not here to just promote what Coinbase is doing, but you've made a couple of moves here lately that are very interesting. And it was funny because yesterday I ran into somebody here and they said, oh, you're going to talk about Coinbase, right? And I said, yeah, yeah. And they said, well, you know, they're just a bank now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my question to you is, the moves you have made have obviously been with an eye towards growing your business, towards making it more profitable, creating something that's longer and lasting, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But if you end up just replicating what already exists, in other words, if Coinbase does just become a bank with a digital skin on it. Have you created anything different? And I think that's what we're talking about. That's what Carlotta Perez is talking about. Things are changing. What are they going to look like in the future? Are we going to create new things or are we just going to reiterate what we had, which wasn't working anymore? And we all saw that in 2008. So, I mean, what are you building at Coinbase? What are you becoming? Yeah, so I think that's a fair question. Um, what, you know, the regulators, of course, would say we're absolutely not a bank. We don't have a banking license, all that stuff. But I understand what people mean when they say that, which is that we're holding people's money and we're kind of um, we're centralizing it in a way because a lot of people have come and used Coinbase. Um, so in that way, you know, we're almost like a victim of our success or something. Like there's a little bit too much power or something in, in one place. So the way I think about that is, is a few things. One, it's, it's the switching cost that I talked about earlier, right? Um, people should always be able to exit, which is, which is not true, by the way, for like, the traditional financial system in the sense that um, you know, Visa or something like that, like, the only way to use the Visa network is through one company, um, Visa, so you don't have like, this option or this choice. Um, the other thing I'll say is that we're very much a believer in um, the idea of having people control their own keys as well. I think for a segment of the population, uh, today, that's going to be very important. And what it, it could actually be 
a much bigger portion of the world in the future if we can get the usability improved. So with Coinbase Wallet, um, we've built a product that people can control their own keys. Um, a lot of the really cutting edge stuff that's happening in crypto, people are accessing through Coinbase Wallet. Um, you know, one of these, so it's, it's just basically this balance of like, how do we get a billion people in the world using crypto? Well, it needs to be very usable and secure. Um, but how do we make sure it doesn't get too centralized in one place? So I think we're basically offering something for both, and we'll have to see how it evolves from there. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny too. I know a lot of people. Everyone knows that crypto Twitter is so tribal, right? A lot of people are going to take that and dunk on Coinbase, dunk Coinbase Bank. But that really is a question that I think everybody in this industry needs to ask themselves. You know, it's. I keep. It's really funny. I keep thinking of. Uh, the Saw Gerrera line in the trailer for Rogue One that didn't make it into the movie, that should have made it into the movie. And I think that movie was better than Force Awakens, but maybe that's a question for another conference. Um, where he says, you know, if you continue to fight, what, what will you become? What will this industry become? What are you fighting against? What are you trying to build? And are you going to build something different and better? And I think even 10 years into Bitcoin's development, that is an extremely pressing question. Mm -hmm. And I think in the last couple of years, to be honest, I think some people in this industry have lost sight of that. Uh, and I wonder what both of you guys think about that. Where is this industry going? What are you building? Will it be better than what exists? Well, I can, I can offer a thought on that. So this is true of all technology revolutions that you know, Carlota Perez talked about, right? Um, when you know, television first came out, it was like this grainy image and black and white and the audio barely worked. And you know, people were saying, well, I'm, I'm, why would I use that? I can get all the information through radio or whatever, right? Yeah. The same thing with electric cars, right? The early things look like toys. And um, that's what we're seeing with crypto, right? So you know, what, you do, what you typically see in these markets is um, certain niche areas adopt it. And then it eventually becomes more and more mainstream. And in crypto, I think of the most mainstream thing you could think of is like swiping your credit card at Starbucks or something, right? And that'll probably be the last area that gets disrupted by crypto. But the areas that'll get, that are being disrupted first are kind of on the, the far end, two far ends of the spectrum. One of them is in emerging markets where people are underbanked or unbanked and they have no access to financial services at all, but they do have smartphones. We're seeing that in Venezuela and areas like that already, which I can talk about. And then the other area on the other end of the spectrum are the power users of money. Um, people like developers who need to send, you know, $10 of crypto to 1,000 people all over the world in the next minute. Um, or it's uh, people who are sending um, like really high amounts, like a million dollars into this investment in the next minute. So crypto is good at these things, you know, very small amounts, very large amounts, um, cross-border payments, real-time payments. And we're seeing those niche areas get adopted first. Um, but eventually, I think it'll eat its way more and more into the mainstream because Starbucks doesn't want to pay 2.2% um, on every transaction, and there's no reason why that needs to be the case anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's also still the case that a lot of people don't really even know how to get into crypto. Uh, I, I was uh, in L.A. earlier this year and uh, went to dinner with a friend, and she said to me, I'd like to buy some Bitcoin. How do I bi buy Bitcoin? And I said, well, you go to Coinbase.com, you open up an <laughs> account, you connect your bank account, and you buy some Bitcoin. But, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, we sitting here in this room, we're all thinking, how does somebody not know how to buy Bitcoin? But I think if you just walk down 6th Avenue and you stop the 100 people and you say to, say to them, do you know how to buy Bitcoin? I bet you like 90% of them don't know how to yeah, buy Bitcoin. I was going to say five. Five might know how to do it. Five out of 100. Five out of 100. I was thinking 10. Yeah. Right. So it, it's still very, very hard yeah. for people to get into this, right? I think once you're in it, you know, then it's a little easier to operate inside of it, but we just don't have enough people there. And there's a whole bunch of things that have to get solved, I think, um, before we can um, really make cryptocurrencies feel um, mass mainstream. Uh, transaction times and you know, getting people comfortable with security issues. I, I think being able to store your assets safely at a place like Coinbase that can do something like cold storage at scale is absolutely necessary. People don't want to put it on like a little hardware wallet that they then somehow keep you know, somewhere. Like, that's just not going to ever be a mainstream solution. So that's why I think it's taken time. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because it, something I've thought for a long time is I think, <clears throat> excuse me, 
there, there are two ways to look at this. One is within the industry, and then one is how the industry is going to fit in the wider world. But within the industry, you know, we see these uh, bull and boom, you know, these, these bull and bear phases, but boom, a bust, we had it, and everyone knows we don't have to go through the history of it, you know. But what I think is really interesting is we look at the price, and we think the price is telling us where the entire industry is at this moment. But I think there are several dynamics going on within the industry, and they're not happening at the same pace. I think the hype cycle got way ahead of the development cycle and the adoption cycle, and it sort of raised expectations to a point that the rest of it wasn't really there. Development is, you know, I mean, look at the Bitcoin cores. Is it even at version one point something yet? Isn't it still at like 0.10 or, I mean, you are still developing the software. Adoption, like you said, I mean, 10, five, 10 people on the street might know how to do this. How do you guys, you know, navigate through all the different dynamics within the industry and then let's talk about how this connects to the wider world. Well, first I would say, I have a friend who said to me, nothing good happens without a rational exuberance, meaning nothing good happens without a bubble to finance it. And if you really think about what happened in 2017, billions and billions of dollars, maybe tens of billions, maybe, I don't even know, came into the sector. A lot of that is still in the sector and now being deployed against developing new protocols, developing scalability solutions, developing lots of other things. And so we will see the benefits of that, of that financial investment that got secured by the industry in 17 start to reveal itself over the next 12 to 18 months. That's the thing I'm most excited about. You know, in our portfolio, we've got about a half a dozen projects that are gonna go live in the next six months. And I'm really excited to see how those go. I think some will do great, some will do terrible, some will do okay. That's the way it is in my business. Yeah, those but are all crypto related. Yeah, 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 yeah. All crypto related projects. And so um, even at Coinbase, Brian, I mean, you, you, you like 3X or 5X or 10X the, the, the engineering investment in our infrastructure in the past 18 months, right? Yeah, I mean, in 2018, we grew 2.6x. So, um, I mean, we have just a variety of products now. We, we try to think of it as like, you know, 70, 20, 10 in the sense of 70% of our business is really just um, exchange and helping people get their first bit of crypto, onboarding all these people into the crypto economy that, that Fred talked about. 20% um, of our investment is kind of in these adjacent bets, like we're building out um, a custodian for institutions, which is helping a whole bunch of money flow into the space there. And then 10% of what we do is kind of more of our venture bets internally. So, um, you know, we're building out Coinbase Commerce, um, Coinbase Wallet. We launched a stablecoin, USDC. So, um, yeah, we're very much trying to help this industry just grow in a whole bunch of different directions. Here's a cool thing they built. Um, you can now store your crypto assets securely at Coinbase in a, in a cold storage system and participate in, a, in staking those assets in a proof of stake network right. without right. exposing those assets to any sorts of vulnerability. And that's the kind of thing, it's just gonna have to be that way, right? People aren't gonna just accept that someone can come and steal their assets if they're gonna stake them, right? So that's core infrastructure that had to get built and Coinbase built that in the last 18 months. Yeah, yeah I mean, you talk about custody obviously is such a big issue and it is on one, level, it seems kind of just a logistical, technical issue, but obviously it's big. Um, Binance, everyone knows, just had a hack and lost. Not a huge amount of money, but the fact that a large exchange like that could get hacked. Uh, they are commonplace, they always happen. Where do you see, you know, where do you see this, the state of this industry right now in terms of that, in terms of the fact that you still can have an extremely large exchange get hacked? Um, we're, what has to happen to make people more comfortable? Yeah, I mean, it still feels like we're in the early days to me. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of really amazing companies in the space that are all trying to build secure solutions. And, um, you know, we certainly, uh, we wouldn't throw any stones, you know, like everybody, you know, we have people trying to break into Coinbase all the time. Yeah. And, you know, so it's something that we have to be very vigilant about. I'd say from the early days, um, we invested a lot in this and just talked, to, we thought a lot about how can we get the majority of these funds um, off the internet 
uh, store them in cold storage, but still provide some of the features that Fred Wilson mentioned, like staking to our customers. There was a lot of innovation that happened there. Um, you know, we're in a world today where we're on generation four of our cold storage. Uh, we kind of rebuild it every 18 months or so. Um, we're, in, we're in a place where we have uh, these you know, data centers actually all over the world that are geographically distributed, and you need a consensus of um, key holders to come together to restore any of these funds offline. Um, we hire you know, third-party firms to come try to break into it, and they, they come pose as uh, candidates applying to work at Coinbase. Uh, the team, you know, typically, the, only the head of security and me know that it's a drill, um, but the person will come in and apply for a job and have a week in the office and try to break into our systems and you know, see if we can um, still be redundant against attacks like that. Have any of them done it? I mean, in every security uh, pen test that we've done, um, they'll give you a report card at the end, like these are weaknesses, these are, these are benefits. Um, and it's always, there's lots of layers of security, right? So they might breach one or two, but hopefully um, not get the whole ball game, right? So um, those are kinds of things that we do all the time. And um, you know, knock on wood, we've, I think we're the only major exchange that hasn't had a breach. Um, so that's really good, but um, it doesn't mean we can't continue to be vigilant. Yeah. I, th I think trading and custody are different things. doesn't mean that the same company can't do them. Obviously, mm -hmm. Coinbase does them. But I think the market needs to understand that you might choose to go trade a pair, you know, on a small exchange in Asia because they offer it and nobody else does, it doesn't mean you want to store the asset there. Right? You might want to go transact there, but it doesn't mean you want to store it there. And you might want to do your staking and your voting in a third place. Coinbase is going to offer that too. But as Brian said, the thing that's cool about this technology is that people can vote with their feet. They, they can custody in one place, trade in another place, stake in another place. Um, I think Coinbase is going to make a solution that makes people kind of want to do all those at Coinbase, but you don't have to. And I think the important thing that, that people need to understand is that those are different things. And you can't, you can't trust an exchange to securely store your assets unless they have a reputation for being a safe and trusted place to do that. A lot of the losses that have happened in this industry over the last 10 years have happened because people made the mistake of thinking that they were putting their assets somewhere that was safe when they weren't. Right. Going back to Mt. Gox. Right. Yeah. One thing we're looking at, too, is um, you talked about self-custody earlier. I mean, I would love to be in a world where people could actually self-custody, say, through Coinbase Wallet and still participate in exchanges, right? And I think, I think technologically that's going to be possible. Um, we're talking about people like Starkware about that, and um, I think that's a good place to get to as well. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I also would like to self-custody some amount of crypto on my phone, right? But I don't want to necessarily have a, a lot of my crypto on my phone, but there's some reasons why I might want to have some here, mm -hmm. just, you know, to have it at the edge as opposed to in the center of the network. Um, and I think what we will see in the next, I think, relatively, you know, near term is systems that allow people to be able to have all of that kind of sync together into one kind of storage system where the assets are where they need to be and optimized. Yeah. Um, like, the way, like the way a sweep account works, you know, in a big bank or something, you know, think about that for crypto assets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you and I were on this stage last year, uh, and a year ago at this conference, there was a lot of talk about the institutional money and it was right around the corner and it's just gonna come, yeah. And now here we are a year later and we're still talking about the institutional money and it's right around the corner and it's just gonna come. Uh, let's just talk about that for a minute, the state of crypto, the, 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 the ties that are being formed between the crypto industry and traditional finance institutional money. Where, where do you guys see that right now? Where do you expect that relationship to go? Yeah, well, I think we have good news to report on that. Um, and Do you now? Largely, that has played out, uh, I would say, yeah. So, like, for Coinbase Custody, for instance, uh, you know, we launched the product about 12 months ago. Um, we just crossed a billion dollars AUM for, for institutions. There's about 70 institutions who've signed up, um, adding about 150 million, you know, AUM a month. Um, so, to a large degree, that's been a success. And, uh, you know, 
there's more and more features in there that we can continue to add. They, they want to do OTC trading, um, they want to do staking, they want to be voting and doing the governance on chain. So um, actually Fred and I just attended an event last night where we met with a bunch of institutional clients and I think that space will keep growing really rapidly. You know, Bitcoin is still the most important brand out there in the world that a lot of them get, get interested in and that's why they, they come to crypto. Um, but I think once they're, they have their Bitcoin position, they start to think about how can we get additional alpha. And you know, a crypto first or a crypto forward company like Coinbase, you know, we now have 30 assets available for, for institutions in, in, in uh, Coinbase custody and some of these advanced features like staking. So they're actually coming there because they want um, a whole variety of things out there in the, in the crypto ecosystem. Well, so uh, the interesting thing about institutions is that when people read in the Wall Street Journal that institutions are coming to crypto, what they think is uh, BlackRock's coming to crypto, Goldman's coming to crypto. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's not what has happened. What has happened is that there are maybe 100 token funds. What do we think? Is that about the right number? Yeah, well, there's probably 200 or so, but... Some of them yeah. are in Asia, yeah. right? So if you go around the world, maybe 100 in the US, maybe another 100 in Asia, maybe, there may be more than that, right? And collectively, you know, those 200 token funds probably manage on average 50 or $100 million of assets. Some, some are much, much bigger than that, right? So that's, that's actually now a pretty big institutional pool of capital, all focused on crypto. And then the second market, is also probably not BlackRock at Goldman. The second market is me, right? So we have now funded, call it a dozen token projects. Every time one of those token projects goes live, we get a bunch of tokens. And all of a sudden, you know, we, get, we own a lot of those tokens. And so we call up Brian and say, Brian, you know, can we put those tokens on Coinbase custody? We go into the institutional part of their business, right? Because we're not, you know, a small holder. Um, and so I actually think that those two buckets of institutions, uh, the token funds and the venture funds, will, will make up the first two big buckets of institutional money. It's not to say that the Black Rocks and the Goldmans won't do something in the space, but I think them, you know, if you think about a poker analogy, for them to take their entire chips yeah. and go all in, I don't see that happening in the next year or two. But the people who are running token funds, they've already done that. They right, are yeah. all in with their capital. Yeah. Totally agree. You, you, know, you talk about um, the custody service and that there are 30 tokens now available in that. But was that a regulatory hurdle? Was it tough to get that approved? And, and what was the process like for that? Yeah, it was. Um, so Coinbase Custody is a New York trust charter. And um, you know, we interface with the New York DFS and, and other regulators around the world. Um, we, we had a lot of really good conversations with them about how we can get more and more of these assets available. And certainly for institutions, um, you know, there's a lot of laws around consumer protection, so you'll see us be probably more conservative in what we add to Coinbase, the, the main consumer app. Um, but for institutions, they should be able to custody anything they want. Including and, a ham sandwich. <laughs> including a ham sandwich, yeah. That's a little inside joke. Yeah, that's, that was when our, <laughs> our lawyer had this funny phrase, they told the you know, institution should be able to custody a ham sandwich if they want, anyway. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's largely been the case today. One other data point I'll throw out there about institutions, um, I think now on Coinbase Pro, 60% of our trading volume is from institutions. Mm -hmm. So I agree with exactly what Fred Wilson said. Um, people were thinking Goldman and BlackRock, and I think they'll get there, but the, the institutions that are coming on today, are some, they look a little bit different, but it's really slowly becoming more and more of all, I mean, every institution is gonna have a crypto part of their business in, in the next few years if they don't already. Yeah. So we, we have we're under two minutes. Um, do you guys want to give me just quickly, uh, you know, one or two big things that you are thinking or looking at, or you know, what are your major thoughts for the next uh, I think six months? Let's throw it out there. I'll go first. I think we will see crypto networks form around core compute infrastructure, and I'm thinking storage. I'm thinking compute. I'm thinking bandwidth. I think we are going to start to see large-scale crypto networks form to provision that kind of stuff in a decentralized manner. We have two, two projects that are going to launch this year in, in that area, um, but there are many more. And I think it's just a perfect, like if you think about like, you know, you got Amazon Web Services, you got these big centralized infrastructure providers. I think it's a very logical thing for um, decentralized networks to come in and compute in that area. I think that's going to be a big, a big thing in the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, I mean, for us, um, so 
we need to start by just being excellent at exchange and custody, right? That's what we talked about at the beginning. And that's what's going to bring you know, the next 100 million people or so into crypto and all these institutions. And we want to just be the most trusted you know, builder of reliable infrastructure there. But the next thing we need to do for Coinbase, and I think for the industry, is um, we need to grow the crypto economy. So this is you know, basically help it shift from being this asset class that people come and invest in or they speculate on and driving the real world utility and adoption of this around the world. So um, I think what you're going to start to see is in, in Coinbase, we're going to take all these kind of individuals, whether they're businesses, uh, retail customers, and that are siloed, you know, just holding their, their Bitcoin or whatever, and actually start to connect them into this economic graph. So um, you're going to start to see, you know, the verbs in the economic graph, uh, things like not just buy and sell, but, you know, I want to spend my crypto, I want to vote, I want to stake, um, you know, I want to invest. So uh, you're going to start to see those opportunities surfaced. And lend, borrow. <laughs> lend, borrow. There, there's all kinds of um, verbs that we need to create in the crypto economy. So, you know, that's one of the metrics we're tracking is like, are we making money for our customers? Yeah. Because if you're seeing um, the crypto economy grow, it's like the GDP of some country growing. Like, more and more people should be getting economic opportunity and economic freedom in the crypto economy. And that's how we know that we'll be successful long term. Yeah. All right. Brian, Fred, thank you very much. Everyone, thank you for your time. <laughs>